So we'll begin the 102 course on the signs with the first class entitled, What are the signs? So what are they? Well, to understand what the signs are, use this basic analogy that the signs are like places and the planets are like people. Planets are like people because they are the lights in the sky which wander about on their own. So they appear to have graha or consciousness. They appear to have cognition and will. So they're like people. And then the places in which they roam, those that space and those are the places and the signs are about that space. If you want to know about the relationship between planets and signs, it's the same as the relationship between people and places. If you think about how people affect places and how places affect people, then you'll understand how the signs affect the planets and the planets affect the signs. People come into a place and use the resources of that place to accomplish their inherent objectives. But the ability that the place provides for them to do so affects the people very greatly, and it may even change their objectives or modify them. So in that same way, the planet goes into a sign, and it will use the character, the nature, the resources of the sign to fulfill its inherent objectives, which the objectives of its inherent symbolism. And then the sign will affect the planet if it's easy or uneasy to fulfill its objectives the planet becomes happy or unhappy and behaves well or poorly and planets will also modify and change which of their inherent symbolic objectives they pursue depending on which resources are available and what sign they're in so that's the relationship between planets and signs the interesting thing now is that there's 12 signs. It's not just one blob of space. There's all different areas in the space. There's 12 major areas. So why are there 12? That's a very interesting question. And not everybody will agree that there's 12. You'll hear people saying there should be 13 because there's 13 constellations. Somebody else may say there's not 13 constellations. I draw the constellations different. There's 53 constellations. Why is there 12 and not 13 or 300? The reason is that the 12 signs are created by the sun and the moon. They are space itself, but the way that the space is going to be divided is dependent upon how the sun and moon, the two king planets, the two main planets, move through the space. All the other planets follow the sun and moon's path, more or less. So the way the sun and the moon move through this space is going to define how it gets divided into sections. Now the best way to illustrate how the motion of the moon and sun divides space into 12 segments is to just use an analog clock. Clocks illustrate the divisions of the zodiac perfectly because their design is based on the zodiac. If you take the clock and you say, okay, the slow hand is the sun, and the fast hand, the long hand, is the moon. And you put them both in the same spot, and then you let the clock run. And put a mark where the sun is every time the moon completes one lap around the whole clock. Then you'll get these 12 divisions. And so that's how the zodiac gets divided into 12 divisions. And interestingly, the nakshatras, which are star regions, are defined in a very similar manner. But with the Rashis, the sun is primary, and then the moon is dividing the sun's path. With the nakshatras, the moon is primary through the stars, and the sun is dividing the moon's path, but there is the sun's movement in the course of a day. So with the nakshatras, you get 27 equal divisions. Yes, the nakshatras are not exactly 27, because there's not exactly 27 days in a lunation in a lunar month, but it's abstracted. It's mathematicalized, it's symbolized to be 27. Similarly, it's not exactly 12 moons in a year. There's not exactly 12 months of 30 days in a year. There's a little bit more, but it gets close enough to be abstracted. And then you just play with things a little bit every now and then to keep it in sync with reality. 
So where is that 12 o'clock position? That defines where everything starts. So that's a really crucial issue. There's two theories about where it starts. One is the sidereal theory and one is the tropical theory. Sidereal means from stars. They're both Latin words. Sidereal means from the stars or stellar. The sidereal theory of where the zodiac starts is that it starts from a star. Tropical means from turning. So the tropical theory of the zodiac is that the start point of the zodiac should start from one of the spots where the sun makes an important turn in its journey over the equator. Those are the two theories. So which one is better? Which theory is better? Well, let's see. First of all, as we saw from the definition of why there's 12 equal sized nakshatras, the signs are defined by the sun and the moon and are an abstraction based on the sun and the moon. They're not an abstraction on the stars. So why should the star, why should a star be the beginning point? If the zodiac were to have supposed to be starting from a star, you would think that at least there would be a star at the spot where the zodiac is supposed to start. But there is no star there. So it's not really compelling to say that the, the right way to measure the beginning of a zodiac is from a star when there's no star there. But on the other hand, there is definitely an important turning point in the tropical system where you can clearly measure the zodiac. In fact, there's not just one, there's four. Tropical, it means turning around and around, right? Turning in relation to the equator of the Earth. So the sun turns like this. First it heads north, and it reaches its first milestone when it gets exactly over the equator. That's called an equinox. Some people like to call it a vernal equinox because they consider spring to start then. The Vedas don't consider spring to start then. The Vedas start spring in February and has six seasons. And also, the people who live in Australia, they're not going to consider this a vernal equinox. So it doesn't matter if it's a vernal equinox or an autumnal equinox. It doesn't matter what season it is. It's an equinox. And it's a northerly equinox. It's where the sun is rising up. North always means up, symbolically speaking. So that's the first waypoint. Then the sun continues to move until it gets as far north as it will get. And that's the northern solstice. When the sun reaches its most extreme northerly point, then it's going to turn around and begin to head south. And eventually it's going to again come to the equator, exactly, and that will be another equinox. This one is the southerly equinox. And then it's going to go all the way back to its southernmost point, which will be the southern solstice. These are the four waypoints, key points in the tropical system, which act as the anchor points for the zodiac. We draw the zodiac circle around the equator and then draw the first line as the first border at the northern equinox. That's where the zodiac starts because it's just like a sunrise. The celestial day is where the sun rises over the equator and then it spends six months in the north. And then when it falls back below the equator, it spends six months in the south. And that's why celestial beings in the Vedas are described as having days which last for one year with daytime for six months and nighttime for six months. And so sunrise is where things starts. The day starts at sunrise and the year starts at sunrise. So the zodiac starts at sunrise when the sun comes over the equator. Then you just do the sun and moon movement with the hands of the clock and you draw your 12 equal size divisions. So you'll get the first zodiac division, Aries, the second zodiac division, Taurus, and the third zodiac division, Gemini, and then the sun will come to its northernmost point and reaches another anchor point. The northernmost point is the beginning of the next group. You get three more segments, Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. Then it's at, at, at the end of Virgo, the sun reaches the southerly equinox, and that begins the next group, 
you get another three divisions, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. And then finally the sun will come to the southern sol solstice, and then you will get those three three divisions within that section also, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. So this is the tropical zodiac. It's anchored to the equinox. It's very easy and clear. There's no debate about it. Now, how about classical texts? What do they say about which zodiac theory is better? The classical texts, both Eastern and Western, define the zodiac tropically, although they also use sidereal stars. Both Eastern and Western systems use tropical zodiac and sidereal stars, not one or the other, but both. And the two are separate. And you have to account for their divergence by a, something called Ayanamsha, how much they diverge from one another over time. And classical texts will make observations about the then current convergence between the two systems. And so ancient texts like Rig Veda will say that Kritika Nakshatra is first, which is the Pleiades. And that was said at a time when the Pleiades were the stars consistent with the beginning of Aries. And then in later texts, which are classical, you'll have statements like Ashvini is beginning the nakshatras, the nakshatras and Ashvini begins the zodiac. And because at the time when those statements were made, Ashvini was concurrent with the beginning of Aries. Well, these days it's gone past Revati and into Uttara Bhatrapad. But Many people have neglected to continue to update their Rashi calculation because they considered that it would permanently be the way that the observations were made in the classical texts, which is unacceptable because then you have to discount the definitions of the Rashis that are also given in the classical texts. And what definitions are those? For example, the Puranas, they all have astronomical sections to them discussing ast astronomy and astrology and the structure of the universe. And this statement from Bhagavat Purana it will be also found in other Puranas like Vishnu Purana. It says, Outer space is measured by the relation of heaven and earth. The sun is the king of all planets in the center of everything, keeping everything together. It moves to the north crosses the equator, and moves to the south. When it goes north of the equator, days get longer, and when it crosses the equator, days and nights are equal. When it goes south of the equator, days get shorter. On this basis, the sun moves through the 12 divisions called Capricorn and so forth. The sun is at Aries and Libra when the days and nights are equal. Passing through Taurus, etc., the days become longer and then decrease until again equal with the night. Passing through Scorpio, etc., the nights become longer and then decrease to again become equal with the days. Of course, this statement is relative to India where it was spoken. But the only part that's relative there is that which is becoming longer or shorter, the day or the night. But the fact is that the, the zodiac is anchored to the sun's movement north and south of the equator. And then they're telling you how to calculate it based on the length of the day and the night. See, the length of the day and night is an easy way to calculate where the sun is in relation to the equator. That's why that information is given. Some people very foolishly say that the Puranas are not important to astrology. Those people are not very intelligent, but just for their sake, we will also quote from Surya Siddhanta, which is a strictly astronomical text that belongs to the Vedic kind of family. So, the Surya Siddhanta says, It is well known that the circle of science is split by two diameters. One is the line from equinox to equinox, the other is the line from solstice to solstice. Between each solstice and equinox are two other markers. Each solstice equinox and the two following markers represent the three strides of Vishnu. The sun has entered Capricorn when it begins moving north for six months. It has entered Cancer when it begins moving south for six months. Seasons last for two signs each, beginning from Capricorn with the frozen season. The twelve signs named Aries, etc. are the months which altogether comprise the year.
So there you go. Those are the classical definitions of the zodiac. The classical definitions are that it should begin from the equinoxes and be anchored to equinoxes and solstices. And this is also the only sensible definition. And an additional point is that most of the symbolism of the signs, which pertains to the modes and the elements of those signs, has no logical basis if the signs are stellar things. But it has a perfectly logical basis. Why certain sign? Why is Taurus Earth? Why is Libra Air? Why is Capricorn Cardinal? Why is Pisces Dual? Those why questions can be easily and very logically answered using a tropical definition of the zodiac in terms of how the sun behaves as it moves over the equator and through the solar system, and also in terms of how the sun pertains to the directions indicated thereby. But without this tropical thing, there's no way to give any logic to those symbolisms. So there's just a little bit of confusion because the ancient texts also have another system for mapping sidereal things, for mapping stellar things called nakshatras. And the confusion then becomes whether the observations about the relationship between the nakshatras and the 12 signs are permanent or not. Those who think they are permanent develop what's called a sidereal zodiac. But those who say that they're not permanent, they're diverging by Ayanamsha, they adhere to a tropical zodiac. And there's a few more grades in between of different people with slightly different opinions, but that's the basic thing. So I certainly adhere to a tropical zodiac with confidence. <laughs>